today is about Win UI 3.0 on building modern desktop applications with .NET and C Sharp. But before, what is a .NET user group? I will, oh, okay, the animation did not run. Okay, good. <laughs> First, uh, it's a user group. It's free for everybody. We have some gold sponsors that we would like to thank. Offering solutions, PPV, and for texture. Today, one of the persons <laughs> that are helping us is here, uh, Mark. Hello. Thanks again, for your continuous support. Also, for our usual locations, when we could celebrate events in person, Back in 2019, looks so far away in time. Impact Hub and the Stanford Group, thanks again to them and to our partners, Azure User Group, um, .NET Central, .NET Day Switzerland, and Chase Angular. Thank you for your support again. Who are we? Well, you know me already. Um, we have Powell, we have Michael Stave, we have Nigel, which is today in the house. Say hey, hi, Nigel. Yeah. We have Laurent, we have Fabian, and Mark Muller. Say hi. Mark. Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> so to be clear, what do we do? We organize events for developers to developers to share knowledge. Um, usually we do a session later on, so it will depend on if we, um, so we do the speech and after the speech, we close the streaming and we are welcome to stay and ask questions and talk about technology or whatever we want. So a bit of networking there. And usually we used to do some beer and pizza back in 2018. Not anymore. We hope we can do that shortly in one or two months, maybe. We'll see. What can you do? You can follow us in Twitter at Donet Zurich. You can follow us on Twitter at Donet Zurich. <laughs> Hello. OK, please mute uh, your mix, please. You can join our meetup group. Probably you are here through that. <coughs> Tell your peers, help us grow, and you are free to propose new content and the speakers or yourself to speak. That would be very welcome. So, Mark. Yeah, um, today we got a little special announcement from our friends of DevExpress. You maybe know uh, that the DevExpress UI controls, even though for WinUI, but they also have um, developer productivity tools for refactoring, code navigation, code analysis, etc. And I think you need to click or something because there should be a link. We have a free offering, so all our members from our user group will get a one-year uh, free license for CodeRush, their new uh, developer productivity tool. It's an add-on to Visual Studio. And yeah, um, if you click the link, you can download it. I will share the link also in the chat uh, register, and you got a free license for one year from DevExpress. Yeah. Which is cool. I yeah. made a bit. Just try it out. It's free. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Cool. Great. Cool. That's all ready. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'll just I'll just post the link uh, in the chat. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Mark, for dealing with all of it and for bringing this sponsorship. I think we we need some free stuff to to motivate ourselves a bit more. <laughs> so, uh, WinUI. The session today is about the modern native UI platform for Windows. Um, Today we are going to see some about the concepts. What is the status today of this development framework, UI development framework, um, and how does it compare to the other proposals that we have in the table, and how to do that in .NET and C Sharp hands on. Who is going to do that? Thomas Claudius Huber, which is on the stage with this very cool panel of LEDs behind. He is uh, nano libs, I guess. Um, he's a software engineer, a Microsoft MVP, book and plural site author, and it did not fit, but he's also an open source contributor. He recently has done quite cool projects in exploring um, search generators and other stuff. And he's a proud father, um, well, and likes to go with the skateboard as well, right? And yes, right. he's a super cool <clears throat> guy and amazing speaker on the other side. So. I hope we will have a cool time with you, Thomas. Uh, Thomas, the stage is yours. OK, thank you.
So welcome also from my side. Thanks for the introduction and uh, yeah, welcome to the to today's session, building modern desktop apps with .NET and C Sharp. The introduction was already perfect, so um, there is nothing else to say. Um, I live here in a house with four four women. I'm married to one, and three the other three are our daughters. Um, no, that's not right. I live even here with five women because the cat is also a woman. So yes. <laughs> and if you want to reach me before or after or during the session, um, yeah, it works only after the session. Twitter might, might be the best way, um, but you can also contact me via my homepage. There is a contact link or just use thomas at thomasclaudiushuber.com or thomas.huber at trivadis.com. All right, but let's dive into the topic because the session is not about me, but about WinUI 3 and all the different desktop frameworks. And today, when you want to build a desktop application with .NET, you stand before the choice, which UI framework should you actually use to build your desktop application? And then you see, oh, there is a bunch of them. There is Windows Forms, there is WPF, there is UWP, there is WinUI, there is Xamarin Forms. And with .NET 6, there will also be .NET MAUI, which you can use to build cross-platform applications for macOS, for Windows, for Android, for iOS, and so on. So we need to sort this, and this is what we will do today. And this brings me to the agenda. We will look in the first part. We will go back in time for some of you who work already with more modern things than Windows Forms and WPF. And for many of you, maybe you still work with these technologies. I do. I have still many customers who have Windows Forms applications and also WPF applications. Um, normally, I work three days per week at a customer where we have a really big WPF application. So um, these technologies are still there. And this is where we start today. And after that, we look at UWP and WinUI and uh, you will learn how these different things relate to each other. And in the, in the third part, we look at cross-platform development um, with .NET MAUI, uh, just to give you an overview what it is about. I heard once that the brain starts to group things if you see more than three items on a slide. So I have only three points on my agenda, but uh, let's see um, if, I, if I can keep this rule during the session. Okay, so let's start. If there, are any, if there are any questions, please hack them in the chat. So, um, or you can just unmute yourself and ask the questions. So feel free to, to interrupt me. Uh, sometimes I might speak in a way that you think you shouldn't interrupt me, but you can always interrupt me. Just throw in and, and bring up your questions. But I will also hang a bit around after the session. So we can also discuss there about the topics that we see here and uh, to go deeper into special things and maybe to do some off session stuff uh, that comes to your mind to look at that stuff. Okay, let's go back in time. In 2001 or 2002, Microsoft introduced Windows Forms with a .NET framework 1.0. And at that time, there was no choice if you want to build a desktop application with .NET you go with Windows Forms because there was nothing else. Windows Forms is built on top of GDI+, Plus, which stands for Graphics Device Interface, which is a layer of the Win32 API that belongs to the Windows kernel or to Windows 10 or Windows 7. So this is part of the Windows API and Windows Forms is actually just a wrapper around this technology so that you can use it in a nice way with .NET. In Windows Forms, everything feels like .NET, but under the hood, it's this native Win32 GDI Plus stuff. Then a few years later, in 2006, .NET Framework 3.0 came out and Microsoft introduced the Windows Presentation Foundation, which was a bit more modern framework because it was built on top of the so-called MIL core, which stands for Media Integration Layer Core. And this is a a library that wraps DirectX. Before the session, I discussed a bit with, with Josie about gaming. Yeah, we talked about gaming and what games we play. And if you play games on the computer, you might know DirectX because when you install a game, 
you get sometimes the message, this game requires DirectX version 11, you have to install it in addition, and then you have to install it. And DirectX is nothing else than a, than a library that gives access to the hardware, and in this case, to the GPU, to the graphics processing unit, so that you can really make use of those powerful graphics cards that, in, that are in modern computers. Today, we have them even in notebooks. But at the beginning of WPF, we didn't know exactly what to do with this. And you might remember the rotating three-dimensional cubes everyone was creating, um, the typical case nobody needs in their applications. And later on, um, yeah, we haven't seen many 3D applications built with WPF, but mostly line of business applications. So the difference under the hood is GPU and CPU for the rendering. Um, but if you want to build a real 3D application, maybe WPF is also not the way to go because there are better approaches, for example, using DirectX directly. From a developer perspective, the big difference was that in WPF, you write your user interface with a XML-based syntax, which is called SAML, the XML extens Extensible Application Markup Language. And in Windows Forms, you build it with C Sharp, or respectively, you use the Visual Designer in Visual Studio, which is quite powerful for Windows Forms. And in WPF, on the other side, the Visual Designer is not used so often because the layout is totally different and it works not so well with drag and drop from the toolbox like you do with Windows Forms. Okay, so with .NET Framework 3, we had the choice between these two. And uh, I started in 2006 with WPF already with the preview versions. Uh, you might also remember .NET Framework 3 was called WinFX at that time. So Microsoft said, yeah, we will bring now out WinFX after .NET Framework 2.0. And everybody thought, what the heck is WinFX? And later they changed the name to .NET Framework 3 and everybody was happy again. And WPF at that time had the name Avalonia. And today is still an open source library available that, that uses that Avalonia name. And that is also a cross, cross compilation framework for WPF. Then later, in the later, later years, .NET Core 1 came out, which is a cross-platform implementation of .NET that runs on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. If you do de .NET development, you might know this. And now when you look at the name .NET Core, when you think, when would you give something the name Core, you would give it the name Core if it contains only the core of something. And in this case, .NET Core 1 contains console applications and ASP.NET core applications. So a core part of the .NET framework because in .NET framework, you have also console applications and ASP.NET applications. But that core part was meant for server-side applications. Think about all the container stuff that also was on the rise with Docker and Kubernetes and everything. And to run applications with .NET on those containers that are usually Linux-based, you need a cross-platform implementation of .NET. And I think this is what something where I'm still today impressed how Microsoft anticipated all these steps with these containerization things to bring everything cross-platform. When I saw SQL Server runs now on Linux, in the, when I read it, I thought, who wants to do this? Who wants to run their Linux server on Linux? But when you, when you have a Docker container or any other container platform, then this is something that should and must work to compete in the market. And so for server-side applications to build a web API and stuff like that, ASP.NET Core runs on all different platforms and Linux supports the Docker containers. I don't know if anyone ever of you used a Windows container. It's possible to do this, but maybe mostly to support legacy software. Um, I haven't seen people using Windows containers. Uh, so yeah, let's see. But now, <clears throat> later Microsoft noticed that .NET Core has many advantages over .NET Framework because it had a better runtime. They could do things differently because they didn't have to look back on the old stuff that they have to support. And 
with .NET Core 3, they noticed, hey, actually, we should make .NET Core the main platform because there we can, we can do much better things. We have a better runtime. It allows us to support C-sharp features that we can't support in .NET Framework because of runtime limitations that, that we have to support the older applications. What if we actually just copy the source code of WPF and Windows Forms to .NET Core and compile it against .NET Core, and then we have it there too? And this is actually, in simple words, what they did. They copied over WPF and Windows Forms also to .NET Core, and under the hood, everything stays the same. WPF wraps that Milkore thing, and Windows Forms wraps that GDI Plus thing. But now you can just build your WPF or Windows Forms application with .NET Core, and you get the latest and greatest features of the runtime and of the C-sharp language. <clears throat> they also open sourced the code. So you can, you can now take a look at the WPF code and also at the WinForms code. The WinForms repository is actually quite, uh, quite active. So they create pull requests and they merge it into the main branch. On the WPF repository, there doesn't happen so much. So a few, few weeks or months ago, someone asked, is this repository dead? Um, this is also always the question people ask if nothing happens on a repository, right? But it doesn't mean that the technology is, is dead. I think both technologies are quite major. But uh, then someone from Microsoft answered that they built up a team for WPF so that they can uh, merge pull requests faster on the WPF repository to bring this also forward. But this already shows that the main the main workforce at Microsoft is already on the more modern part, which is WinUI. We will see that later, but today it looks like this. Now, a question you might ask if you are on WPF while using .NET Core, let's also clarify this. There are a few advantages. The deployment, for example, you can deploy with .NET Core side by side and self-contained. This means you can bundle the whole framework with your application and then you can give it to a clean computer where nothing is installed and it will just run. This is different to .NET Framework where you have to ask your administrator to install all the .NET Framework versions on the different machines and everything. And then if a new .NET Framework version comes out, you have to wait until all your clients have that version and so on. So this pain goes away with the self-contained side-by-side -side deployment and it means one application can use .NET Core 3, another one can use .NET Core 3.1, another one can use .NET 5 and so on. You can just bundle it with your application and it won't be affected by the other applications or other frameworks installed on that machine. But if you want, you can still do the traditional uh, approach. If you say, okay, it makes not much, much sense if I have 200 applications and every application brings .NET Core with it. Another advantage is the core runtime and API. This gives you C sharp features version eight and version nine. So if you want to use the latest C sharp version, you can only use it if you run your application with .NET Core and .NET Framework has their limitations. Then performance is a bit better. Um, you won't feel this in a WPF or in a Windows Forms app uh, in a traditional way. Think about performance that when you think about the origin of .NET Core, which is a server-side framework with ASP.NET Core, where throughput, file access, database access, all these things must be highly optimized so that when you have 100,000 concurrent connections, it should really be performant because then you will notice if a connection takes 50 milliseconds or 45 milliseconds, things like that. And if you do in a .NET Core WPF application, for example, if you, if you do a file scan, if you scan the whole file system, it will be faster than a .NET Framework application that does the same thing. But the rendering and all that stuff is the same because under the hood, you have that Milcore DirectX stuff, which didn't change. The last part is that is also an advantage is the .NET CLI, the command line interface. This is quite powerful. If you want to run commands 
in your continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, scripts, then you can just use different co .NET commands to do everything, which is something that I really like because it's so simple to build the project, to run the tests, to package a NuGet package with the CLI. All that stuff is quite comfortable with .NET Core. So we have these two parts. And when you look now at the two frameworks, it's also the case that .NET Framework 4.8 is the last major version. So Microsoft won't bring out a new version here, but they committed that they will support it for the lifetime of Windows. Um, so I think Windows will live for quite a few years. And if Windows won't live anymore, then we might have anyway a problem with our Windows desktop applications. .NET Core on the other side is the future. So it, it gets developed. And with .NET Core 5, Microsoft started to drop the core from the name because as I mentioned before, at the beginning, they thought, they thought this is the core of .NET, but now they moved everything over and it's no more the core, it's the proper thing. And so they just omit the name core from .NET Core since version five. And um, I think some, some people might still use it. And, but I think in one, two years, we are used to it and we will just say .NET 5, .NET 6 and so on. Here is also interesting, these versions appear every year in November. And every second year, we get a so-called long-term support version. And uh, the difference is the long-term support version is supported for three years. And the other versions are supported only for one year. But it's not exactly one year and three years. There is, a, I think, a plus of three months. So the long-term support has three years and three months so that you have time to switch after the three years. And the, the other ones have one year and three months so that you have also time to switch to the next version. Why is this important? It might only be important if you have, for example, an application where you say, hey, I don't plan to touch this application for the, for the next three, four years then you should think about or consider using the LTS version as that gets security updates and all that stuff. And if you work on an application, you can just increase the version because then you will go from .NET 5 to .NET 6 to .NET 7, which is, I think for most of my customers where I work at, is this usually the case that they just, it won't happen that they won't build a feature for three months, so I guess, they will just switch to the newest version when it comes out. For new applications, you shouldn't use .NET Framework anymore. This is a recommend recommendation from Microsoft. So you should create the new application with .NET Core so that you get all the features that you have there. So there is no reason to build a new application with .NET Core. But there is also <clears throat> no reason except the advantages I mentioned to port an existing .NET Framework application to .NET Core. So if you want to use the latest c -sharp version, that's a reason. But if it just runs and you don't build new features, just keep it on .NET Framework. Microsoft Visual Studio is actually also a WPF application and it runs on .NET Framework. I don't know if it gets ported to .NET Core in the, fe in the future, but maybe that's possible. But Today, I think it's still .NET Framework. And let's see if Visual Studio 2022 is a different thing or if it still runs on .NET Framework or not. But yeah, that's a different thing. It's also an existing application and it shows maybe a port is quite hard because they have also many interop and com things there that might be a bit harder to port. <coughs> now .NET Core, as mentioned, is a cross-platform framework, runs on different platforms, but WPF and Windows Forms run only on Windows. This is something many people get wrong. Um, they run only on Windows, no matter which framework you use. So .NET Core is that Windows only part with WPF and Windows Forms, and it has the cross-platform part with ASP.NET Core, Entity Framework Core, and Machine Learning.NET that, that runs also on all different platforms. And if you have existing .NET Framework applications, you can build class libraries with .NET Standard 2.0, 
and you can reference them from .NET Core and .NET Framework. This means what we did at some customers is porting existing class libraries from .NET Framework to .NET Standard, but we keep the, the WPF application with .NET Framework, but we port the class libraries to .NET Standard if that's possible. And this means in the end, all the class libraries can be used already in a .NET Core application. And the only thing that needs to be switched is the client project that is on .NET Framework. And uh, this can be done in the future if it's wanted or necessary and else they just keep it there. If you have only .NET Core, then you don't have to use .NET Standard. You can build .NET Core class libraries, which gives you some advantages. Um, for example, one advantage I, I, I saw recently is when you build a .NET Standard 2.0 class libraries and you want to use that nullable reference type feature, I don't know if you have heard about it, but it allows you to, to annotate reference types with a question mark to, to mark them as nullable. And then the compiler will tell you where you can or where you have problems in your code where a null reference exception might appear. And .NET standard is not marked with these nullable types, but .NET, .NET 5, for example, or .NET Core 5 is. So if you target with your class library .NET 5 and you turn that feature on, you will see many errors. And if you target .NET standard 2.0 and you turn that feature on, you will see no errors because .NET standard doesn't have these annotations. So that's the reason why you might want to target .NET Core then later instead of .NET Standard, or you can even target both if you want with the project. <clears throat> okay, so let's wrap this up. .NET WinForms and WPF, we have seen this. They were ported to .NET Core, which is the modern framework and they still exist today. You can build applications with them. And I think they will support it for many years to come because now they are on the most modern platform that is available, which is .NET 5, and you can use them there. Now let's look at the next beast, and that's the session of the title, UWP and WinUI. The universal Windows platform um, is a special thing. So right now you can build desktop apps with .NET that we have seen with WPF and Windows Forms. And with Windows 10, Microsoft introduced besides this Win32 hosting model that sits on the Windows 10 kernel and that is used by WPF and Windows Forms, Microsoft introduced the universal Windows platform hosting model um, that has different things, like for example, a modern Windows API that is called WinRT, which stands for Windows Runtime. This is a modern API that uses .NET metadata to describe its contents, and it uses also .NET concepts like classes, properties, methods, and so on. At that time, you might also remember <clears throat> uh, WinRT was introduced already in Windows 8, and Microsoft introduced also an operating system that was also called Windows RT, and that led to a bit confusion. Um, but that API that was introduced in, in Windows, Windows 8 is now in Windows 10, and it is part of the universal Windows platform. But UWP, Ash, yeah? You have one question in the chat. Do you want me to read it out? Yes, please read it's it. From Samuel M. Um, do you know what is the reason why the Visual Studio Designer for WPF.NET 5 is as low compared to the, then the one in .NET Framework? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good uh, question. The reason is they had to rewrite the full designer and it's a different hosting model with .NET Core. So they, they can't load the designer that is built with .NET Framework into Visual Studio. They have to load the .NET Core runtime in the, into the process and run this behind the scenes. So that should be the reason why it is slower than in .NET Framework if, it's that the, if that's the case for you in your machine. To be honest, I haven't noticed this, but uh, the reason for this might be because I'm not using the designer. So uh, that's hard. Yeah, if you, if you don't use your screen wipers, then you don't know that they don't work anymore. And yeah, so 
<clears throat> I think that's the reason it's a different hosting model, but I, th I think we will see optimizations there. The Windows Forms designer had even a harder part because that was not supported at the beginning. And now there is a version, but it's still in preview. And uh, the thing is they had to write every, rewrite everything for this to port it to the .NET Core stuff to host it there. But yeah, maybe you can can give more details about this. What is low end? I have to try it, but, but to be honest, I, I haven't tried the designer in the last, I don't know, years, maybe. Okay, let's continue. UWP contains also beside the WinRT, a SAML UI framework and SAML controls. And now the important thing is these parts are built into Windows 10, which means they are native in Windows 10, built with C++ and built close to the metal. And on top of that, you can build a UWP application with .NET or C++ that uses SAML, a very similar syntax like known from WPF. And then you can run that application on Windows 10 and you can also bring it to the Microsoft Store if you want. One of the big advantages of UWP is that it runs on different platforms. You can run your application not only on the PC, but also on the HoloLens or on the Xbox or on IoT devices, like for example, on a Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> but now there is also a little disadvantage of UWP, and that is that your application suddenly depends on a feature that is built into Windows 10. The controls and also the UI framework are a part of Windows 10. And this means if you want to build a UWP application with the latest and modernest tree view, for example, you want to use the latest control, then your customers, your users have to use the latest Windows 10 version so that you are able to use this control. And this is a huge dependency problem. And this is something Microsoft solved with the Windows UI library. First, they introduced WinUI 2.x, which is a NuGet package with the name Microsoft UI SAML. And you can install this in your UWP application. And in simple words, what they did is they copied the SAML controls to this NuGet package. And, um, and then you can reference that NuGet package in your UWP application, and you will get the latest controls without having your users to switch to the latest Windows 10 version. That they copied the whole thing is not really true because it's still in Windows 10 for existing applications, of course. <clears throat> but now with this part, um, they didn't reach the end because you see the SAML UI framework is still in Windows 10. And so WinUI 3.0 is the next thing they introduced and that is available already today for production applications. And it contains also the SAML controls like WinUI 2. But in addition, they took now the SAML UI framework from Windows 10 and they copied it to WinUI 3. And so WinUI 3 is a full blown NuGet package that contains a full UI framework like WPF and Windows Forms R2. So we have another UI framework that is now decoupled from Windows 10. Now, <clears throat> You can also watch on GitHub the code of this one and you can discuss and talk about features. And I recommend you to take a look because the team usually does also every month a community call where they talk about new features. Sometimes they show new things that are coming up, which is quite interesting. <clears throat> With WinUI 3, building a UWP application the traditional way is now the deprecated or obsolete way, because from a traditional UWP application, you can't reference that WinUI 3.0 NuGet package. It's not meant to be used in such an application because it such a UWP application depends still on the SAML UI framework of Windows 10. Instead of doing this, there is a new application template in Visual Studio called WinUI in UWP. And you can use that template to create a UWP application 
and you will automatically have a reference to this WinUI 3.0 NuGet package. This means you can forget about the traditional UWP approach for new applications, and you can also forget about the SAML controls and SAML UI framework in Windows 10 for new applications. Now the interesting part is, so you have now this UWP, UWP hosting model, but there are a few differences to the WinUI Win32 hosting model. For example, it runs in a sandbox and that sandbox can be a limitation and maybe you want to use the WinUI uh, Win32 hosting model. And you can also do this with another template that is called WinUI in desktop. And this template allows you to create a Win32 application that can do everything that does not run in a sandbox. And it uses the modern SAML UI framework that comes with the WinUI 3 NuGet package. Also WPF and WinForms can be modernized with a technology called SAML Islands. So you can bring in WinUI 3 features into your existing applications if you have a need for this. I think it always depends if you have a really huge application and you see WinUI 3 contains something that you want, then you can just use it. <clears throat> if you have a small application, you might consider instead of SAML Islands to migrate it to WinUI and to directly use the newer framework. Now, if someone asks you, what is WinUI? WinUI is actually the native UI platform of Windows 10. So all the parts in Windows 10, like the start menu or the settings um, window, they are built with WinUI. And uh, you can do this now too. Thomas, so you have, yeah? we have another question. Yeah. It's from Horst. Yes. Of, of, um, uh, the SAML designer is no longer available in WinUI 3.0. Do you know when it will be back? No, I don't know when it will be back. I hope we will get some news there um, at the build next week. <clears throat> and so that, that we see there what, what happens there, but I don't know when it will be back. Uh, and so, and there is also nothing I'm not allowed to talk about. So it's really zero in my knowledge about this one. Okay, we will not ask about that. I have another question this time is from me. What's the current parity from the SAML uh, controls uh, um, of WinUI 3.0 with WPF? Yeah, we, that's a good question. The controls is often something that we that we look at and maybe we, we look at this right now when the question appears. I have it later on my slides. On the, on the Microsoft Store, there is an application that is called WinUI 3 Controls Gallery. So the, you can search for this application. And that's a WinUI 3 application that allows you to browse all the controls that are available in WinUI 3. So for example, you can look here at basic input, and then you see here button checkbox and so on, and, and hyperlink button. And you can click on, on one of these, I think let's take color picker. And then you see what, what's available here, what you can do in WinUI. You see also here different things, collections, data grid. And yeah, here's not, ah, it comes now up. This is a video. Here you see th something with the data grid. And then you ca can click through this date and time or layout and menus and toolbars and so on. And you can click through and you can see then, hey, what's available there? and is something that is a must for my application available or cannot I find it in this application, then it's not there. And so you can look through this and then you will find out, hey, the features are there and maybe they are not there. So most controls are there, but data grid is still something in production. I think the one that is here is a third party one. I think it's from Telerik, but I'm not totally sure. And so there is something on GitHub that is discussed that comes. Also input validation is something that is missing in general that will come. Um, but other things appear, like for example here, the tab view that we have a proper tab control. Uh, this is now also something that is available for you. If you use actually the Windows terminal, which is a, an application that you also get from the Microsoft store, you can see this Windows terminal uses WinUI, it's a WinUI application. It uses the tab control that you see here. It's exactly the same control. So it's built with WinUI. You can also look at that one 
it's open source. But back to your question, check out this WinUI 3 controls gallery in the Microsoft store and install it and then just browse through, browse through these different menu items here and you will get an impression what's available for you. And there might be parts from WPF that you miss and there might be parts that are even better. And yeah, so check this out and then you can see if a switch might be good for you. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now with the hosting models, when you compare these UWP and desktop, first you write nearly for all things exactly the same SAML and C-sharp code. So it doesn't matter which hosting model you use. The difference is the desktop model runs on the PC and the other one on other devices. UWP is sandboxed, which means you have to declare capabilities. For example, if you want to use the internet connection, you have to declare this. If you want to access documents, you have to declare this. Like you know it from mobile applications where they say, this application wants to access your documents, your camera, do you accept? So this kind of things that make sense with a store. A Win32 application on the other side has full access. Now, if you build for the PC, there might still be a reason to go with UWP and that's the lifecycle management because UWP applications, they can save battery power because they are suspended when you switch to another application or when you minimize the application. This means they really save processor power and so the battery, which might be important if you build an application for a tablet where battery power is important. On the other side, the Win32 application, it's always running when you start it, no matter if you minimize the window or if you navigate to another application. But also here, um, it's interesting to see uh, the biggest point is you write the same SAML code and what Microsoft actually wants is they want that you don't have to make the choice of UWP and desktop. You don't have to make the choice which framework you can, should use to get the latest technology. So you can use WinUI and WPF2 to get the latest stuff. So different things like that. And now when you start with WinUI, you will see something also that is called Project Reunion. This is the project that Microsoft has. And uh, they say now, okay, with WinUI, you can use .NET or C++. So also the C++ developers that were hanging on MFC before they switched to um, before Microsoft brought out WinUI. Also the C++ developers can now use the latest technology because think about them. They couldn't use Windows Forms. It was .NET only. They couldn't use WPF. It was .NET only. And now WinUI is also available for C++ developers if they want to use it. So you can choose .NET or C++, UWP or Win32. You have that choice. And the project reunion is a bit hard to understand when you read about it, you think, what is it actually and what do they do? And when you, they have also a GitHub repository and WinUI itself is one project of this project reunion. So it belongs to it. And what the goal is of them is they want to provide all the stuff as new get packages. When you think as WinUI, what I showed you now, they exported the framework and the SAML controls from Windows 10 into the WinUI 3 NuGet package, which means you can reference that NuGet package and you get these features. And this is what Project Reunion is about. They do the same with Windows 10 APIs. They provide a NuGet package that contains all the code that you need to call the APIs. And then in your application, if you need to access a Windows 10 API, you just reference the NuGet package and then you use the code in that one. And it feels like C-sharp in C-sharp and it feels like C++ in C++. So it really feels like the platform that you are using. All right. <clears throat> so when we wrap this up, we have these three parts, uh, built Windows desktop apps uh, with .NET. We have WinUI that supports UWP and Win32 and we have WPF and Windows Forms on the other side. Now let's take a quick look 
at the WinUI desktop application so that you get an impression uh, if you haven't created one on your own. I have a Visual Studio instance open here. And um, in Visual Studio, um, let me minimize this a bit. Wait, I need to hide my sharing thing. Yeah, it seems to be impossible to hide this. I move it a bit down so I can see the extension menu here. <clears throat> when you go to manage extensions, um, you can search in Visual Studio for reunion. And then you find that project reunion uh, Visual Studio extension that adds the project templates for uh, WinUI projects. Before we had that WinUI 3 project templates extension, but as you can see, it's now marked as deprecated because this one is the new one. It has just one vote. Um, so maybe you can vote, then we have two votes or a bit more. Um, but I noticed, I think more people voted, but they don't show up so quick. But as you can see, this extension is installed on my machine. This means when I go to file new project on my machine, um, I have here on the right side in the dropdown, I have WinUI. And this brings up here a class library, WinUI 3 in desktop, and a blank app, WinUI 3 in desktop. WinUI 3 in UWP is not available yet for production. So it was available with the WinUI 3 project templates extension. You could create a WinUI 3 in UWP app, but with this latest extension that is that you can use to build production ready applications, the in UWP option is not available. And maybe we will hear something about that at build um, and maybe not, I don't know. But now I select this one. Packaged means that an MSIX package project is created that you can use to deploy your application in the Microsoft store or also to deploy it to your Windows 10 machines. This is a modern packaging format of Windows 10 that allows a clean installation and uninstallation of an application so that you don't leave registry, registry clutter and stuff like that on the machine. You can also use MSIX for WPF applications. So it's nothing special for WinUI, but special is that currently you don't have an option without MSIX. But the discussions on GitHub, they say that an, an option without MSIX should come soon. So maybe at build, we will see something like that. I go to my favorite directory, dtemp.net winui app. And I just create this one. Now comes a pop-up with a UWP specific thing. This is just for the packaging project. Keep here the default values and click OK. And now that WinUI 3 project will come up. And you will see if you are familiar with WPF, it's nothing special compared to WPF. So now we have th two projects, the application project that contains a main window SAML file with code behind file, app SAML file with code behind file. So if you have worked with any SAML framework in the past, like Silverlight or WPF um, or Windows Phone, then you will know this is where you are at home. Then there is the packaging project. And under applications, you see it is referencing that application project and it is packaging it as an MSIX package, which means you get a .msix file. When you right click, you can click here on publish and uh, select here create app packages. Then you get such an MSIX file. But this project is not special to to WinUI, when you go to file new project, you can search here also in this dialog um, for packaging. And then you see here this Windows application packaging project that creates MSIS, MSIX packages. You could use that one also for your Windows forms or WPF applications to play around with it. Now, when I try to, to build this, um, I get an error <clears throat> and you see the, it says this version of project reunion requires WinRT runtime DLL version 1.2 or greater. And um, what Microsoft did, 
they have now also as part of Project Reunion, a project that is called C Sharp WinRT, the C Sharp Windows Runtime API. And WinUI depends on that API and it needs a specific version. And Microsoft delivers that C Sharp Windows Runtime API with the .NET SDK. This means this error will go away if you install a later .NET SDK, you see, please update the .NET SDK 5.0.6. Um, I don't know which one I have on my machine. Let's check .NET list SDKs. Yeah, if you have 5.0.3 preview, well, the current one is this one, 5.0.2. So I should install that that newer one maybe, and then set that preview SDKs are used. For this, without the SDK, you need to do a workaround. And I copy this. They write here that I need to add this item group to the CS project file. So I do this, else I cannot build this new application. Unfortunately, the copy copies also the whole text. So I remove the text here. And all I want is this item group that was visible in the error. And now um, it should just build. So let me try to build the solution. And now this should work. <coughs> build succeeded. <clears throat> so let's run the application. I need to minimize my window a bit because I don't know how I can hide the zoom control here. That's the application, yeah, not much. There is a button that you can click. So uh, exactly what we need for our business to, to, to manage their processes. But now you can start developing the application. So let's do a little MVVM thing to get a feeling. Um, I will also do something. I will, let's create a new project, a class library project. Uh, dot, let's call it .NET WinUI app dot view models. And I reference a library that I have created in the last uh, weeks and you will see much of this, but now you get also a little impression how to build view models with C sharp source generators, which is a new way to do things. The library is called MVVM Gen. This will allow us to write our view models very quickly. So let's do a little master detail screen with employees in a list and in a detail. So I create here a main view model class. <clears throat> and on that class, I set the view model attribute and I need to use MVVM gen. And now we get here an error. The class should have the partial modifier. Now what happens behind the scenes with this, MVVM gen hooks itself up as a source generator. So you see it here and it generates here this main view model class uh, that inherits from a view model base class. But right now there is not much inside. Now let's just develop here something so that we have a little detail view model. Let's create here a partial class employee view model. And I say an employee should have a first name. So I use here the property attribute from MVVM gen. And I create here a first name field. I copy this. Let's create another one. Let's say bool is developer. And let's save this. <clears throat> and now you see also for this employee view model, there is a generated file. And when you look at this side by side, I scroll down, you see here is the first name property that raises on property changed in the setter. When I scroll down, you see the is developer property. So all you have to do is just copy these things. And I could say here, last name, string and you see how it's created on the right side. So it's generated on the fly and you can use it immediately. But you actually don't have to look at the generated code. Now in this main view model, I create like I would do in WPF and Windows Forms. So all of this is .NET standard. So it would work the same way in WPF and Windows Forms. I create an employees property 
we can use here target type new expression. I want to write a getter here. So now I did it right, okay. <clears throat> and I create also a selected employee property, employee view model, selected employee. And now again, I just need to mark this one with the property attribute to generate the property behind the scenes. In addition, normally we would pass a data provider to this view model. Um, I just hard coded here. There is an on initialize method that is called from the generated constructor. And here I just add to the employees property, I add a few employee view models. Okay. Now I have a few. That's good. The view model is ready and we can use it in our WinUI app. So I just reference here that view models project. Also interesting when I double click the WinUI app and I scroll up in this one, you can also see here, this is a .NET 5, so .NET Core 5 application. So it's the latest framework. And um, now let's go to the main window SAML file and let's just use that view model that we have created. Main view model, it should come up here. I remove the rest and I generate that read only property. <clears throat> um, the traditional binding, if you are familiar with WPF, you would do something like this. Um, this doesn't exist on that WinUI window right now, but it exists on all the controls. So theoretically, I could um, define here, let's do this, a grid. If I would have here a grid, I could set on that grid the data context property, and then you can bind with the traditional binding. But in WinUI and also in UWP, you usually use compiled data bindings with the XBind markup extension. And this is what we do now in our code here in SAML. So let's quickly define here on that grid two column definitions. Let's give this one a width of 250 and the other one just a width of star, which is the default value. And I put into this grid a list view, item source, not item spanner. Sometimes I wish IntelliSense would uh, know what I think, but we are still not there, but maybe right <clears throat> one day. Now you see here XBind. XBind is different. It doesn't use the data context. Instead, you see here all the members of the main window. And so you find here the view model property that we have created in the code behind file. And I can bind here to the employees and I set the mode to one way. I also bind here selected item to view model, selected employee mode two way. And let's set the display member path to show the first name in this list box. Now let's create a stack panel in the second column. And I put a text box into this one. Let's give it a little margin. And let's set the text on this one to X bind view model selected employee dot first name mode two way update source trigger property changed. And there is a header property, which is something that does not exist in WPF. And I really like it because it means I don't have to create the label in addition, I can just use the header. And then I have a label for the text box. And now I'm good at copy pasting. So I copy paste it and I bind another one to the last name property. And we can also add the checkbox is checked, X bind. And you see the nice thing we get here really IntelliSense and we can bind to that stuff. And it's just a bit of typing, hitting enter to select IntelliSense to get all of this. And now I don't know if I've if I've coded everything right, but let's see. Now we should see this little user interface 
where we have a little master detail screen available. And yeah, it's building. Yeah, now we see on the left side, the list view is filled with a few items. When I select a few, yeah, you see here we have the only developer. I forgot to label the checkbox, but this is the is developer checkbox. Uh, let's make Nitro in Laurent and mark developers too. So now, yeah, I'm not a developer, no checkbox. And, and now you can navigate through this. Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, let's see if editing works. Yes, you see it updates on the left side. So pretty much the same as we have with um, <clears throat> with WPF in SAML. So it works the same way, it feels similar, but what you get is the modern look of Windows 10. So you get the controls that look like Windows 10 and you get an application that really has the latest features of WinUI. So nothing much different from the developer perspective you see everything looks the same, grid, list view, stack panel, text box. If you are used to WPF, there is nothing much different. Maybe you wouldn't use XBind, you could use binding as well. It also exists. Then you have to set the data context and you can bind to this one. You can mix and match actually. You can use binding and XBind in one project if you want. Um, but I'm a fan of XBind once you get used to it. Uh, it has also the advantage, look, if I misspell here, for example, first name, I write just first name, then this is underlined. And when I try to run it, everything gets compiled. And um, this should actually show me an error. Yeah, it gives me here an error. The property first name was not found in type employee view model. So you see you get with XBind these compile time errors and not the, the binding errors at runtime. Okay, this was a very little demo of WinUI 3 in desktop. So <clears throat> try it out, install the project reunion extension and then just play around with it. Thomas, we have another question. Yes. And it's um, from Martin. And the question is, if there is a supported path to convert a WPF application to WinUI <laughs> latest and greatest, or we need to rewrite the whole UI? Yeah, that's a good question. And <clears throat> there is no no path to to rewrite uh, to migrate the existing application. But look what I already did in this project is and this is what I recommend if it's possible. I moved here the view models into a separate project, which means I could now go in the solution and I could say okay, I create a new WPF project and I just reuse the view models also in that one. Yeah, it's, it takes a while to search. But, but you could now reuse that library in the existing application. But for the UI project, there is nothing like that. Well, technically, there is uh, some of Iceland that should yeah, suffice yeah, exactly. to, to exactly. host the WPF and then everything should work, even probably exactly. not, not optimal. Exactly. Technically, there is the way to host to host WinUI controls in WPF with SAML Islands. And uh, this would mean you can, you can use new features or maybe you can just migrate parts of it. But there is, as far as I understand it and as far as I think Microsoft wants it, they don't want um, that you have to port your whole WPF application to WinUI. They think because you know, look at the big applications. I don't know if you if you work on applications that, where you spend more than one year working on them, they grow and grow. And then you reach the point where you think, okay, it will be a lot of work if we move that one to a new technology. And, and so they don't expect that you move your WPF or also your Win, Windows Forms applications to WinUI. But Win, WinUI SAML Islands allows you to modernize WPF applications with the latest controls if you want to do that. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in the other direction. So you can't create a blank WinUI app and host your WPF, your WPF controls in WinUI. But this is something that was requested and maybe we will see this also in the future, but 
I don't know if, if there are any plans to support this. But I know, for example, a few WPF applications where you have a quite a complex WPF control, which is the limiting factor why you can't migrate to WinUI. And if you could host that WPF control in WinUI, you could migrate that application to the new platform if you want. But yeah, right now, to migrate the full application to get something like try convert, there is nothing like that. But mm -hmm. let's try quickly something. Look in this simple application. If I reference here view models and I go to the code behind file and I say here data context equals new main view model. And yeah, now I have even a little trick that I show you. Oh, let's keep it like this. But let's go to the WinUI app. You will see that many things are very similar. So I can copy this and I can go over to the WPF app and paste it here, paste it in. What does not exist is XBind. So now I should replace XBind view model with employees. But what, are you, what you can do, what allows you a bit mix and match is that you say you create, like in WinUI, a view model property and you set into the data context your own control, which means then you can just say instead of X bind binding, you bind to the view model property of your control and you grab the employee. And um, if you don't do this, if you assign the view model directly to the data context, you have in addition get rid here of this view model property and do it like you would do it traditional. But if you mix WinUI and WPF, you can go it this way, create a view model property like in WinUI and assign your whole window to the data context then you can use exactly the same binding path for the binding. And now look, I just changed X bind to binding. I should have used control H to do this. The header property does not exist. I remove that one. The rest should be the same. So now I should be able to set this as a startup project and run this one. <clears throat> and we should see the WPF application. Yes, and now we have everything in the WPF application. And yeah, the UI looks not so nice. Yeah, we have to do a <laughs> bit of styling, but but it works. <clears throat> so by structuring your application like this, this works. But now you also see already that uh, maybe it would be great if we could define user controls with SAML that work in the different platforms because they are quite the same. So with .NET, we have something that is called I have here .NET 5, but it's, we could make this a .NET standard library. We could use .NET standard to, sh to share C sharp code between different frameworks. But with SAML, we don't have something like this. And this is something that was on the list, which was called SAML standard. There is even a repository on GitHub, but this one, I think this one is really dead because this one. <laughs> Ouch. I, I see Glenn smiling. Uh, uh, this That's... one is really dead, the seven standard. That's yeah, okay. It's quite hard, you know, because on the other side, there are more frameworks that use SAML, for example, SAM reinforms. And to align all of this, it just slows down all the different frameworks because think about the meetings, the WPF team and the WinUI team and the SAM reinforms team. They have to make meetings to align all of this. And, and we all know if you don't have to do meetings and you just say, let's decide this and let's go that direction is much faster than if you have to coordinate all those things. Of course, for us developers, it would be nice. I could move the main window to a library and then I could reuse it, but uh, yeah. But interesting is the other way around if I would copy this one, the WPF part into WinUI. Let's try this one. This will just work. So in WinUI, you see there is no error. So the binding is just there. So in WinUI, we could now say on this grid, we give this the name grid as the window does not have the data context. And now we just say here, grid data context, and we assign that new main view model. And now we use the binding markup extension like traditionally. And um, I think this should work too. And so now we have copied from WinUI to WPF. We saw XBind doesn't work in WPF, but the other way around, 
binding in WinUI, this one <laughs> works not. Okay, I did something wrong. The item source view more. Ah, yeah. <clears throat> now here, I should do it the same way. Let me press Control Z. I should do it like this because I I kept the view model property um, in the WPF project. So now let's see. Yes, now it's here again. This was my fault. But actually, there is also at runtime, I don't know if it exists for WinUI already, there is a, a, a new window in Visual Studio that is called SAML binding failures. I don't know if you have seen that one. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't see it here in the WinUI project. Let's see with the WPF project. And maybe let's let's do something wrong. Let's bind here to fit name. Yeah, here is it. Here is this new SAML binding failures window. It doesn't have an error yet because the binding didn't appear. We need to select something. And now you see here in this error, you see uh, there is a data error, binding path, fit name on the text box. And you see also here, fit, na fit name property not found on object of type employee view model. So this is also something new that you can use at runtime in WPF to find out SAML binding failures. I don't know if this will come to the binding markup extension in WinUI too, maybe, but normally you would use XBind there. Okay. <clears throat> SAML controls or WinUI controls gallery. We have seen that one. I showed it already before. Check it out in the, in the Microsoft store. So this was UWP and WinUI. Now let's continue with the last part, cross-platform development. Uh, what's going on there? Before .NET 6, we had Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, and UWP. And on top of that sits Xamarin Forms, which is an abstraction layer that allows you to build user interfaces with SAML and C Sharp. But it has a different syntax and some different class names. For example, the stack panel in Xamarin Forms is called stack layout, and the data context is called binding context. So a few differences, but it's pretty much the same. Now, since .NET 6, which is a look into the future because .NET 6 will come out in November this year. Since .NET 6, we have WinUI instead of UWP. Microsoft renames Xamarin Android to .NET for Android. And Microsoft renames Xamarin iOS to .NET for iOS, and Microsoft renames Xamarin Forms to .NET Multi-Platform App UI, or short, .NET MAUI. <clears throat> but this is more than just a renaming. Uh, .NET MAUI tries to achieve everything for the different platforms with a single project. This means with Xamarin Forms, you had, for example, separate projects for iOS and for Android, and then a common one with, with your user interface. With .NET MAUI, you will have a single project in Visual Studio that you can use to target the different platforms. This has the advantages that if you add, for example, a, an image to your project, you don't have to think about how to add that image on Android, how to do it on iOS, and how to do it on Windows. You just add it in your project, and MAUI will find out behind the scenes how to do it on the different platforms. But now, also a question that comes up quite often is, what should we use, .NET MAUI or WinUI? Now you see, they are on different levels. WinUI is a native platform like Android and iOS. WinUI is the native framework for building Windows applications. And .NET MAUI is an abstraction layer that allows you to build cross-platform applications. So if you don't have a cross-platform scenario, then you could directly use WinUI. If you have a cross-platform scenario, you might want to take a look at .NET MAUI to see how this uh, works. And maybe if it's super great, you could also use it just with WinUI as a target 
and then you are open to support other platforms in the future. With .NET MAUI, Microsoft also brought in macOS as a native platform. And this was possible with Xamarin Forms as part of a community project, but now it's officially supported. And this shows that .NET MAUI has also a focus on desktop applications. Before it was more mobile applications for Android and iOS, but now with WinUI and macOS as targets, it has a clear focus on desktop applications, which is really interesting. And I look forward to it and to see how this evolves. Beside .NET MAUI, there is also an interesting open source project that is called Uno Platform. If you haven't heard about that one, you should also check this out because this one is not in preview, it is available today. And what Uno Platform does is, it allows you to write SAML and C Sharp like you do it in WinUI. Actually, you are building a WinUI application so you can compile to WinUI. But they use also Xamarin under the hood to compile to iOS and Android and macOS. And what they also have, and this is the most interesting part, they also allow you to compile your application to the web and then your application runs natively in the browser with HTML, CSS, and the code is compiled to WebAssembly. They do a full translation of your SAML code to HTML and CSS code. And what they promise is pixel perfect layout. This means you get exactly the layout and the look like in your native WinUI application on all these different platforms. So it's something to check out. I find it very interesting Uno platform and it has also a big community already. And they also work closely together with the WinUI team at Microsoft to really bring WinUI on all the different platforms, which is great for us SAML developers because Uno has, has um, the concept, they say they don't want that you have to decide if you build a web application or a Windows desktop application or a Mac desktop application. They just want you to build an application and they care about the different platforms so that it will run everywhere. This means these two options exist today for cross-platform applications with SAML. There are also some more open source projects beside Uno platform like this Avalonia project. So research for this one from the open source part, Uno platform is not the only one, but I put it here because related to WinUI, it is the platform that brings WinUI on all the different targets. All right, so that was it with cross-platform development. Now we are through and I think my hour is over and um, let's wrap this up. You have saw, you have seen in this, in this session that WinUI 3 is the modern framework for Windows 10 apps. You can check it out on GitHub Look at the issues there and you see the community calls. Um, I think I'm not totally sure. They are always on the third Wednesday every month and they are live streamed on YouTube, but you will see issues there. And you also learned it's part of Project Reunion. That's the, also the name of the project uh, of the Visual Studio extension that you have to install. And the current version can be used to build production apps so they they say this is no more a preview. Everything you find there is production ready and you can use it to start to build your applications. But it's still not a 1.0 release, so that one will come in the future. I also mentioned Uno platform that brings WinUI everywhere, including the web. <clears throat> WPF and WinForms, if you have applications on these, they are supported in the future. Modernization, we talked about it, there is no real migration guide, but you can also think a bit about like when WPF came out, we also have interop between Windows Forms and WPF. And we thought about how to migrate Windows Forms applications to WPF. And to be honest, I haven't seen many Windows Forms applications be ported to WPF. Many people stayed on Windows Forms and they started new projects with WPF. And I think it will be similar to, to WinUI. So I think we will see the same thing. But important for you is Microsoft wants that if you have a WinForms or WPF application that you can use the latest features 
that come with WinUI with the help of SAML islands. So if you see something in WinUI and you see and you say, hey, that is something we really would need in our application, then you don't have to port your application. You can just use it in your existing, existing application with SAML islands. The last part, .NET MAUI is Microsoft's cross-platform solution. We will see that one um, this year with .NET 6. So the final release or the first release is with .NET 6. And uh, originally, sometimes I think about it, if the pandemic wouldn't have been here, the original plan was to release all of this with .NET 5. So this was last year in November, but now we are one year behind. and. Um, so with .NET 6, we see all the stuff that should have been here already with .NET 5, but it's quite interesting. Okay, so we are through. I hope you liked the session. And uh, now we have a little Q&A. You can ask stuff. We can look at different things if you want. And if later a question comes to your mind, also free, feel free to ping me. Here is my email um, that you can use. Um, and I can't hear you. We can't hear you. I think you're still muted. Oh, yes. Thank you. So I uh, repeat again. And uh, thanks, uh, Thomas. It is a great session. I think some hands on, some interesting, well explained topics. And now I guess everybody here understands what is Project Reunion, what is uh, Windows <laughs> UI, and Windows MAUI. And also we explore it a bit hands on. Um, we have one more question pending. It's um, from Horst Hoffel. The current productive reunion version is 0 0.5 of WinUI. Uh, it yeah. uh, lacks the hot reload function. When yeah. will it be also be available for production? That's a good question, Horst. Um, that one is uh, that one is not related to the project reunion thing is related to the Visual Studio version. And I think they have somewhere in the docs uh, written that they have the hot reload in the preview, but I haven't tried it. So let's try it with my project um, to open it. I think here I'm on 16.9.5, yeah, which is the current one. I think you should have it with a, with a preview edition. So let me copy the folder path and let's close this one. And let's open this one in uh, in the preview. So I think there it is. Ah, yeah, I am already here. Yeah, so I think as soon as, as .NET 6 and Visual Studio 2022 comes out, uh, then the tooling might be aligned a bit better to see all of this going well. And now let me also check which preview version. Ah, now, now after the session, I found out that I can move this Zoom thing that was always in my way. Um, let's check what version this is. 16.10 preview three. I think this is the latest preview. I think I updated yesterday, but I'm not totally sure if it was on this machine or on my laptop, um, but I guess so. Now let's uh, let's run the package project. Oops. Sorry, I clicked on a context menu. Let's set this one as a startup project and let's run it and let's try to change something on the fly. Let's also see if we see the tools there. Live visual tree, binding failures. Yeah, we see the live visual tree, but I don't see the tools there. I'm not sure. Yeah, hot reload. 
But let's just try it. What could we do? Maybe let's move this one to the right, Visual Studio to the left. <clears throat> and um, well, let's just add a text box here. Yeah, and you see it appears. So yeah, so with the latest Visual Studio preview version, this hot reload should come. So it's it's not a WinUI project reunion issue. It's more an issue of the of the tooling that also gets updated. So I think it's aligned. Of course, the WinUI team might be the team who does the tooling there so that it works. But if you switch to the preview, you you will get this hot reload thing. And I think in the current Visual Studio version, it does not work. Yes. We have one more question from Martin. Is the performance of WinUI better than WPF? Yeah, it definitely should be because it is built um, directly on the metal. So the we have C++ under the hood. So performance should definitely be better in WinUI than with WPF. But right now, you know, it's something I say, you know, you hear it already with the words should and must. Um, I think so, it will be better, but I haven't built really big applications right now with WinUI and with WPF, you also don't notice a difference, but we all know with WPF, you have to take care to keep the, the visual tree small so that the application is performant. And uh, two weeks ago, I was at a customer, they have a use win huge Windows Forms application and I looked at the code and I run it and I thought, wow, this is really fast compared to all the WPF stuff I usually do. And WinUI, I think it should definitely be faster. And you also have to keep in mind, you could do theoretically an application with C++. And the interesting part there is the SAML code for a C++ application would be exactly the same. And I recommend, I really recommend you to try a C++ application if you need a performance intensive application because writing C++ today is not like writing C++ 10 years ago. It looks pretty much like C sharp and it's not so much difference. There is still these weird uh, syntax contracts uh, constructs at some points, but as a C sharp developer, I think you can manage to do this. But overall answering the question, we should definitely see more performant applications because all the stuff, the framework, the controls, they are built with native technology with C++. So I hope to see again there in performance, but we don't know today, we will see in the future. Did you already try this Uno stuff? Yes, I tried Uno stuff already. And, and what's um, your opinion? I have created before the session a little Uno project just here. <clears throat> and, and I think it's really powerful. It's really powerful. So if you haven't tried it, I recommend you to give you a go. The company who has created Uno, um, they had many WPF and also Silverlight applications. And customers with many WPF and Silverlight applications, I think around 200 applications, and some of them needed to go to the web. And so instead of porting all the applications to a new technology, they decided to build something to compile SAML to web stuff. And um, I'm not sure if this one is running, but let's try it. Now it runs completely in WebAssembly. We had a session on Uno in Was February. It, uh, I, or who did it? Uh, <laughs> check. Uh, I posted the link to the to the chat. Ah, okay. Yeah, I will take uh, a look at it. It was one of the members of the Uno platform. Yeah, then it was Jerome Laban. No, David. David Oliver. David Oliver. Okay. Yeah, he's one of the core engineers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. So. 
now I switched to the wrong project. But now, interesting is, look, here I have this Uno solution. I've unloaded a few platforms. You have usually projects for different platforms. You see here the WinUI projects. You see a WebAssembly project, Android, iOS, and so on. And then there is the shared project. And in this case, I have here a view model folder where I have a main view model, employee view model, quite similar like we do, did it now. But in this case, I programmed it fully without using the code generation like we did. And in the main page, when I go to this one, the same view model assigned and in the SAML code, it looks pretty much similar. I have to select here Windows desktop so that the SAML looks good. So you see, I use XBind and so on with the selected employee. And then I can run it in the browser and this works natively. You see the master detail stuff. It just, it just works and it looks exactly like, like the native application. So it's definitely something if you say, hey, I want to build an application and maybe I want to bring it to the web or to another, to another platform. If you have already a WinUI application or even a WPF application, then you could try how easy is it to bring the WPF application with the SAML code to WinUI. And from there, you can directly compile it to the web and, and then it will work. But depending on the controls, you know, you, they need to support the controls, the custom rendering and so, so if you use third party controls and stuff like that, it might get more difficult, but it's definitely something to check out. The question is also what I have here is, what is about .NET MAUI where they bring out a web assembly target? And I don't know today if they have any plans about this, but uh, it would be strange if they wouldn't have any plans about this. So, <clears throat> so there is the question, hey, maybe .NET MAUI brings out something to target web assembly could also be possible. But personally, I think UNO is a nice project and it might allow you to bring your application very easily to the web. Yep. Um, to me, it makes it strange because with this, you can run your code and your UI everywhere, even the web. So yeah. why, <laughs> why, why haven't Project Maui announced it that they will support web? That looks yeah, like exactly. a smart move. Otherwise, mm. it's like, uh, okay, we support everything but the web. So, okay, everybody jumping to the Uno platform, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, when you think about internal stuff, we saw WinUI is a native platform. And from .NET MAUI perspective, it's just a single target. And when you think you are in the WinUI team, then you think, okay, for MAUI, we are just the target. And for Uno, we are the core thing that is going to other platforms. So... Yeah, I think this is also one reason why they really like Uno in the WinUI team because it centers WinUI. WinUI is there, the core part, and WinUI goes cross-platform. And with, with .NET MAUI, WinUI is just a target of your application. Yeah, so, but we will see what the, what the future will bring there. I think it also depends a bit. <clears throat> Many companies, they only want to use technology from Microsoft. And so I think if you build for desktop, macOS and Windows, then .NET MAUI might be the way to go. But if you want to bring a, an application to the web, this could be a totally valid and great approach. And it is also working because they ported already many, many applications to the web. But on the other side, if you start from scratch and you know already that you have to build for the web, then you might go with Blazor or another technology. Yeah. Depends how much HTML and CSS you want to learn, right? <laughs> it's getting complicated. Yeah. So I guess we will have to wait until when is the release? In November, end of year, December? Yeah. In November. Cool. Everything in November. Yeah. Yeah, November will be the big month. Every everyone is vaccinated. We go out to restaurants, eating, and we have .NET six. It wow. will be great. Yeah, 
<laughs> Let's hope for that. So do we have any more questions? Or if not, I will stop the stream.